when the governments think about it, and that's where the debt sustainability ratio, when people talk about debt to GDP, remember that both are moving parts. So long as your GDP is likely to keep growing, uh, governments can keep on taking more debt so long as their ratio is under control, right? Because the government is potentially for forever. Debt is, according to some people, a bigger innovation than even the real. Debt, I would say, on the whole, is the reason that it has lasted uh, at least five, six thousand years. Is the I mean, it, it, it would, if it was not productive, it was not good for human society. It would have withered away. Right. Uh, so I think it is good. Uh, when it becomes bad, is when uh, it becomes unsustainable and then it starts to stress the very fragment or the, the very uh, uh, forces that hold society together, right. which is trust. Because the government, because you know, you're effectively spending other people's money, right. there's also a tendency to be a bit casual about it, yes. right? That, uh, oh, I will free bus ride to someone or, or this train ride is now free. Now, all of that uh, is may not be the best and productive use of capital. So there needs to be caps on what the government can spend. Hello and welcome to another episode of Open Dialogue by Access Bank. Today we cover a very interesting topic which is on debt. It's estimated that uh, as of uh, middle of 2023, the total global debt stands at about $307 trillion. And the global debt to GDP ratio is upwards of 300%, which means that the world has borrowed three times uh, its annual income already. What is debt? What are the implications of debt? Is it good? Is it bad? Can it be a catalyst for growth? Or is it a time bomb in the ticking? We discuss these topics today. Joining me today is Nilkant. Uh, Nilkant Mishra is the chief economist at Access Bank and uh, uh, he needs no introduction. He's been on our uh, show multiple times. So we'll get directly into the uh, conversation. Nilkant, thanks for joining us today. Good to be here again. So Nilkant, uh, uh, before we get into kind of more uh, tactical questions, let's just take a big step back and just talk to us about what is debt and what, what is its history, where did it originate and you know how it's worked out. Uh, yeah, you know, debt is, according to some people, a bigger innovation than even the wheel. Okay. Uh, in terms of the impact it has had on human society and how we've developed. So it's, it's as good as if I have some surplus and you have a deficit, uh, or if you can put my surplus to better use than I can, then I give it to you. Right. And, uh, and so debt. Uh, while, of course, now we think of it as money being transferred, earlier it could be that you had a year of drought and someone had surplus grains. Allowing people to survive through the drought would have kept the population intact. It was in everyone's interest for that to happen. And whenever then you had a surplus crop, you went and repaid it. The acceptance of debt has also, or uh, uh, so as it became slightly more monetary, uh, there was a lot of philosophical debate around it. Uh, so over and above, you know, things which are which are philosophical in nature, like you know, in Hindu scriptures they talk about the rind, right? That pitri rind, like you know, the fact that your parents brought you up, you have to pass it on. And there are there are debts which carry on for multiple generations, which can be actually monetary in nature as well. So in a way, debt is uh, is something which is which has been studied philosophically uh, and very deeply over, over generations and over, over millennia. And uh, in the early days, there was a sense that this was sinful, that uh, lending and charging interest on something was a sin, uh, though lending by itself was not, not, not uh, sort of frowned upon. Uh, but then uh, that was only when the rich were lending to the poor, when banks emerged and the, the, the savers, the small savers were pooling, uh, pooling their savings into banks and then the banks were lending to large corporates or aristocracy. Uh, the religion 
the religious views on interest then got diluted. So basically, allowing people to uh, uh, to get returns for providing their savings to someone uh, became much more socially acceptable. Uh, one last point. So uh, remember that this 307 trillion dollars of debt is debt for some entities, could be individuals, the governments or corporations, but they are also assets uh, for another set of people mm -hmm. and they could be again corporations or individuals, usually not governments. Uh, so which is one of the reasons why the, the ratio can be much higher and still be sustainable because for some people it is uh, a way to deploy their excess savings and other people can actually use it more productively. No, fantastic. So, uh, so if I were to just paraphrase Nilkant, basically, let's say uh, I have a farm and I am unable to farm it because I don't have a bullock maybe and you have some extra money. If you give me that money, I can, you know, maybe rent or buy one and, you know, uh, till my farm, uh, some produce comes out, I sell it. I can pass on some of that to you, keep the rest for myself. You are better off, I am better off and the economy is better off. Correct. And so debt in that way is a great way for the economic productivity to go up uh, uh, significantly because productive assets get deployed at productive points versus Correct. You know, staying in your safe as an example. Correct. Uh, in which case you wouldn't have gotten the return, I wouldn't have had my Absolute. Uh, farm and you know, uh, the economy would have, been, would, have, would have been worse off. And the second point you made is that uh, this notion of uh, uh, interest being uh, kind of quote-unquote unholy, sin, yes. sin, which by the way continues in some regions even now. Yes. Uh, but that changed at the time when the rich started to borrow because then even religions looked at it as saying, look, it's the kind of the rich guy paying the poor guy. So, it's a social benefit versus yes, exactly. Usuri, which, was, which would have been the other way. Uh, so, very fascinating, very fascinating and I think the history of debt itself uh, is, is, is quite uh, fascinating. Right? So, let's move on a little bit to now, you know, uh, like is debt good or bad or is there is there a prism that you can look at it or, you know, is there context to it? Um, so, that's where, you know, the, the philosophical view of whether is it, is it something that you are taking on for, for consumption or for investment. What are you taking it for? Right. Right. And how productive is it? So, if you are, uh, and, and in some cases, even taking debt for consumption is also better for everyone else. Right. Right. So long as you have the ability to repay it. Right. Debt, I would say, on the whole, is the reason that it has lasted uh, at least five, six thousand years is, um, is the, I mean, it, it, it would, if it was not productive, it was not good for human society would have withered away. Right. Uh, so, I think it is good. Uh, when it becomes bad is when uh, it becomes unsustainable and then it starts to stress the very fragment or the, the very uh, uh, forces that hold society together. Right. Which is trust. So, the moment, you know, you, some entity, whether it is government or a corporation or an individual, takes on more debt than they can sustain. Uh, the point at which the realization dawns on everyone that that debt is unsustainable is a very stressful point for society. And which is why you will see that uh, over a period of time, as we have, uh, as our society, as our, as our economy has globalized, the global economy is much more interconnected, as we have learned how to uh, handle a rapidly growing financial system, uh, the the focus on debt to GDP ratios, I mean the 300 percent that you started off with, the that focus on debt sustainability uh, has become much more important. So so long as uh, the debt is sustainable and is repayable and everyone believes it is repayable, I think debt is good. Right. So you use this word sustainable uh, in this context. So what is sustainable and kind of what how do you decide or how do you define that? something is sustainable, debt in this case is sustainable or has it reached unsustainable levels? So, like what we do in our banks, right? So, we look at debt service coverage ratios. I mean, right. So, if, if uh, the cost of servicing the debt, just if I earn 100 rupees, I have say 50 rupees of surplus 
so 50 rupees I spend, 50 rupees is my surplus. And if I take on a debt where the principal and interest payments are 20 or 30 rupees, then it is serviceable. So right. in case, even if my income was to fall by 20-25%, I will still be able to service the debt. So there is a sufficient amount of cushion and that I can sustain this for the period. So if I say take a 100 year loan, of course I can't take a 100 year loan, right? Because I, I may not survive that long. So, so when you think about sustainability, you have to think about uh, not just current income, but future incomes. So sometimes what can happen is like what happened during the, the previous decade that you, your say steel company's EBITDA per ton was $300. On that EBITDA, they took on debt, which was say two and a half, three times debt EBITDA. Suddenly the EBITDA per ton fell to $100 or $80. And then the debt EBITDA ratio went to eight or nine times. And then the debt became unsustainable. So, so uh, one, the sustainability can change over time. So when you are issuing debt or taking debt, I think you have to keep that in mind. Um, and the duration for which an entity can survive also becomes very important. Uh, but prime FSC, it's about uh, whether the borrower has the ability over time to repay the debt. Understood. So debt is good provided you have the cushion of uh, safety that let's say your income falls or the interest rate goes up, you are still able to repay it uh, because then it provides leverage on your returns, right? Yes. Like uh, if your return was let's say 10%, if you take debt, then it it gets magnified to maybe yes, 12% yes. or 15%. But on the downside, it can hurt on you. On the downside, it can hurt you even more. So debt increases leverage uh, and it increases risk. And so if you have the cushion of safety and you're able to uh, kind of pay back, then it's good. But otherwise, uh, it may be problematic. Correct. And, and uh, what you're doing with it. So, for example, take, take Sri Lanka or Pakistan, right? Why are they in trouble? It is because they took on a lot of debt, built infrastructure, which was then not usable. Right. Right. So many local governments in China today are in trouble because they took on debt, uh, built infrastructure. So, I mean, generally, at, on first principle, you would say that building of infrastructure is a good thing. But uh, like apparently on the border with North Korea, uh, there is a giant immigration hall where not even one person goes for immigration. Uh, there is a, a massive flyover where there is no car. Yeah. And so if you take on that debt and build something which is unsustainable or is, is not going to give you the productive returns, then that debt becomes unsustainable. So that is that is what I would call bad debt. Right. Great. So, uh, Nilkat, we'll move a little bit to debt taken by nations and let's start from there and then we move to corporates and individuals. So, if we, if we, uh, if we think about countries, uh, so what do they borrow for? And who do they borrow from? Uh, if you can throw some light on, light on this. See, what is the government? The government is just, uh, or at, at least in the current state, I mean, there was a time when there were kings and kings had uh, you know, thought very differently and acted very differently. But today, the state is effectively us, right? collective us. Governments uh, sometimes Actually, these days seems like all the time, but uh, it is supposed to be only some time where they want to spend more than what they can get in terms of taxes. Right. And uh, the state, or the government, in principle, can last forever. So it doesn't, I mean, unlike a human, which can die off and then the, who will take care of the debt, in the gov case of the government, the, you know, the, the country will remain forever, potentially. So, if you want to spend more for the future, basically, suppose you want to build infrastructure, which will be helpful to grow the economy. Uh, like say, if the National Highways Authority wants to you know, build a lot of highways, uh, and, and there are these classic problems of you know, chicken and egg, where uh, if you don't build the road, I mean, how will the traffic come? Because the economy won't grow. So in this case, what you do is you borrow and you build that infrastructure that allows the economy to flourish because that road then creates more economic prosperity and then taxes go up and then then road kind of pays for itself. So you're just time shifting uh, uh, and, and this, this can only be done by the government right. because no one else can do it. Uh, so this is one reason why, why governments would borrow. 
the second could be an investment in human assets so you may may not be as a poor country have the ability to invest in healthcare or education but uh, if you don't do that 20 years later you will have a set of adults who are not healthy and who are not sufficiently trained and therefore not very productive so you could actually uh, borrow from the future which is which is why you take debt then you uh, basically uh, spend it today in the hope that later on this becomes payable when the governments think about it and that's where the debt sustainability ratio when people talk about debt to gdp remember that both are moving parts mm. so so long as your gdp is likely to keep growing uh, governments can keep on taking more debt so long as their ratio is under control right because the government is potentially for forever and you are effectively so who do you borrow from uh, in a given year of course you borrow from anyone who has a surplus so as a saver i can give money to a bank account or to a bank so that they can onward lend the bank can then choose to lend to the government or the corporate i can choose to uh, directly buy government of india bonds uh, or any country's bonds um, or there can be foreign investors who uh, can say that look Uh, this government is paying the best amount of interest risk adjusted and i don't see much risk with the currency and therefore i want to buy this bond so in that sense the government is almost like any other borrower uh, that they uh, the advantage they have is that they can potentially borrow for 100 years like you know austria very famously issued a 100 year bond uh, what a couple of years back uh, so you can borrow very long term you can borrow at the lowest costs Uh, and because it is the collective uh, uh, promise of the taxpayers you can actually if you use it productively you can you can do wonders right right because individually you and i cannot borrow at those kind of prices correct but once the state promises that look i can so then you get at uh, capital at very low costs uh, and for very long duration so you can actually do wonders with it if you want great so nilkan why don't we take india as an example and just talk about you know how does this look for us as a country how has it moved over time and then what are we doing with the borrowing that uh, that we are doing so uh, let's take the central government uh, and, and then of course the, the provincial government the state governments also have their own budgets and their own deficits and all of that this year give or take for 2024 we will be i think spending about 47 48 trillion rupees back crores uh, about 18 trillion rupees 18 lakh crores would be the fiscal deficit hmm. and about 30 lakh crores is what the government expects in receipts right so taxes direct taxes indirect taxes and all that in terms of expenditure the so about 1/4 of that about 24% is interest so effectively all the debt that you have already taken uh, you you need to pay of course service those those savers and uh, so that's a very large cost about 15% uh, of the total expense is salaries and pensions uh, there is about i would say uh, of the total expenditure i would say about uh, about 3 trillion so i would say 7-8% uh, is defense uh, which includes the salaries and pensions of the uh, of the defense personnel and all that and uh, and some defense capex about 10 trillion rupees which is about 20% is capex which is be spending on national highways railways and uh, ports and so on so forth um, some capex for bsnl you know the 4g network for bsnl and all that uh, so this is how broadly the government spends uh, the 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 structure of how uh, how much the government should be allowed to borrow right because see what happens is uh, if the government borrows too much because the government is also borrowing effectively uh, at the, uh, in the same market as corporates are or individuals are but as we discussed the government because of the very structure uh, is the first borrower right and is the first feeder uh, and the if the first feeder feeds too much there is too little i mean uh, left for the others so there is also a crowding out so then the government if it spends too much it uh, it tends to crowd out uh, now uh, are there caps can we put uh, put in place caps so that the government 
because the government because you know you're effectively spending other people's money right there is also a tendency to be a bit casual about it yes. right that uh, oh i will uh, give uh, whatever free bus rides to someone or or this train ride is now free now all of that uh, is may not be the best and productive use of capital so there needs to be caps on what the government can spend so even at the time of independence when the constituent assembly was writing india's constitution there was a group which wanted caps on government spending but there was another group which said that look it is the sovereign the sovereign needs to have flexibility and that brings me to one point that i should have mentioned earlier the government occasionally borrows from the future to smoothen out economic cycles mm -hmm. see what happens when when you are in a down cycle yep is that uh, people become scared they reduce consumption companies are too scared to invest and therefore the government then has to come in and supply the aggregate demand so they borrow from the future invest the economy recovers and you know things so, so it smoothens out the economic cycle now if it is a it is a drought or a flood or some war then if the government spending is capped we might even lose the war so that that camp then said no no there should not be any any limits on government spending so the compromise was that the uh, that at some point the parliament will pass a law where the government is responsible to the parliament for a certain fiscal deficit ratio and if right. they are not able to meet that they will have to explain why they can't meet it so it's it's a very it's almost like you know a self regulation that you uh, remember that this was done in 1950 the constitution was adopted uh, till 2003 uh, there was no <laughs> regulation on yeah. uh, fiscal responsibility so 2003 if you remember was the frbm law uh, the fiscal responsibility and budget management act and and that's the first time that the, and this also happened because uh, after the i think it was the fifth pay commission uh, the government expenditure shot up yep in, on salaries and pensions and this was around the time when india had tried pokhran so there were you know problems and kargil uh, and kargil war happened uh, and there was the asian financial crisis yep exports were slowing Uh, and then there was a dot com bubble burst and the taxes were going down so the government was really fiscally constrained and and that's when uh, even the the new pension scheme was launched uh, when the government realized that oh god that we have a defined benefit scheme for for government employees and this is going to be absolutely unsustainable in a few decades uh, so so that was when a lot of fiscal shocks and remember that the economy had started to open up right so after 91 so uh, that is when the first frbm law was passed but it took us a while to be really responsible in the sense that uh, because after 2003 4 the taxes just took off because the economy was booming global economy was doing very well actually the fiscal deficit used to come in below what the government had targeted for most of these years right they couldn't spend fast enough there was so much tax coming in uh, but then when the financial crisis hit and governments uh, uh, you know expenditure went up taxes went down uh, and i think very unwisely they they doubled government nearly doubled government salaries in the six pay commission they gave us 65000 crore loan waiver uh, and that really put a lot of fiscal stress uh, or or brought on a lot of fiscal stress around that time the finance ministers every every year would say oh you know what we need to adhere to this target but this year we cannot correct that is that is all they needed to do and and they went ahead with it then around 2014 15 uh, the frbm review committee was set up uh, where they discussed that uh, the problems with first generation fiscal rules uh, and the first generation fiscal what what india adopted in 2003 was attempted in the late 60s early 70s in europe and other developed markets uh, they were found to be pro cyclical so if you put a fiscal deficit target or cap that you cannot have a fiscal deficit say about 3% then in a down year or in a, in a when the economy is going down your taxes are falling your expenditure can't be cut because a lot of it is interest and salary and pensions uh then you actually start curtailing discretionary expenditure that actually intensifies the downturn the downturn correct so uh so the second generation uh, uh 
uh, fiscal rules that have been adopted over the last 20-30 years uh, target more medium term uh, objectives. So, the FRBM review committee then gave a target of a debt to GDP that, right. that uh, instead of targeting annual fiscal deficits, let's target a uh, but you know different countries have adopted very different measures and it's actually quite fascinating how uh, federal governments split the debt responsibility between the center and the state, center and the provinces, the duration for which the budget management happens. Like India does it on an annual basis. You'll see that the, the US does it on a 10-year basis. So right. whatever happens, there's a congressional budget office, which then gives a 10-year budget projection. So different countries manage it differently. Uh, in India, I think uh, versus a 60% debt to GDP target, and it was about 70, 71% when this target was given. Because of COVID, uh, we are well above it. So uh, at the peak of COVID, uh, or the year after that, we were at about 88, 89%. And I'm talking consolidated, not just yeah. central government. Uh, currently, we are at about 81, 82%. Uh, we'll have to keep growing for the a decade GDP, yep. uh, and keep bringing down our fiscal deficit annually for it to fall back to about 70% by 2032, 33. Right. So, uh, Nilkan, there were many things you mentioned uh, in your last response, and we'll pick all of them actually. Let's start with. A uh, very topical uh, subject, which is this old pension scheme versus the new pension scheme, and you also mentioned it. So to start with, can you just explain to us what is this? What is OPS? What is NPS? What is what are the implications of the two, and so on and so forth? See, one of the biggest challenges um, for for any society is how to take care of the retirees, right, of the old people. You can, and so therefore, broadly two types of, uh, so pensions are what, what are supposed to help them in their retirement. So there are two types of pension benefits that you can provide. You can have a defined benefit scheme or a defined contribution scheme. A defined benefit scheme means that the, the organization, uh, I mean, it used to happen with US automakers also, and they went bankrupt because of this. And there, there lies a, therein lies a lesson as well for all of us. But mostly in, say, in the Indian government, uh, for till 2000, people who joined before 2004, they are on a defined benefit scheme. Right. Which means that uh, you can draw 50% of your last drawn salary at the time of retirement. And it is also inflation adjusted. So every time there is a pay commission, you know, every 10 years, uh, there is a pay commission. Uh, and it uh, uh, allows for a pension adjustment uh, in terms of payouts. So this is seen as something that can uh, sort of protect people in their old age and provide them comfort. So defined benefit meaning that the benefit to the pensioner is defined. Defined. They get fifty percent of their salary last till salary. they till they survive. Infl inflation adjusted inflation till, adjusted, till, they, till, till they, they survive. Till they survive. Uh, the benefit is defined. Whereas, I guess in the other case, the, the defined contribution. contribution yeah. is, so, defined contribution scheme is you pay as you go yeah. uh, while you are working. And there could be a sweetener from your employer, in which case it could be the government, or it could be the bank, it could be whoever. Uh, so, at the time of retirement, and so the new pension scheme is exactly that, that you keep depositing it, you, you have some flexibility, you want to deploy it in equity, you want to deploy it in debt, whatever. Which fund, what type of fund and all that. And at the end of retirement, at the time of retirement, so when you are say 60 years old, uh, you can then draw, draw that out. You can deploy that into a into a, a, an annuity kind of scheme. So you put 100 rupees and you say draw 8 rupees every year so that your monthly expenses are going to be taken care of or you can take out the lump sum, do something with it, right? So defined contribution schemes, as you can imagine, um, are much more predictable. The problem is that for the pensioner, uh, all the risk then resides on. Like for example, uh, someone who retired in 2009 and thought that say a 30, 40 lakh uh, provident fund sum was sufficient, uh, guess what, five years of inflation and then suddenly that whole, uh, I mean, you know, you, the payouts today are, are abysmal. Right. right. Whereas if it had been, uh, and the people who are on defined benefit schemes, because of inflation there, uh, their payouts uh, kept going up. Now, or if you, or by the way, if you lived longer, then in the defined yes, benefit scheme, 100%. it's fine because you get 50% of your salary Absolutely annually. Right. 
but in defined contribution there is a, a corpus and you kind of uh, you know run out you of have to corpus spread it and out so over and and you are you are uncertain as to how long you're going to live exactly and, and um, <laughs> so so here the risk is completely on the pensioner now this is why uh, governments uh, you know and especially given that the political leadership and this is where i mentioned earlier it's so easy to spend other people's money right because it's taxpayers money so you do whatever you want to and because the politicians are generally working together with the the, the bureaucracy so every day they are getting to hear only one side of the story the challenge and the biggest problem with the old pension scheme is that while i think the objective of uh, providing protection to old people is a very very genuine one and i think uh, it has to be respected the biggest problem is that you are providing it only to about 2% of the population correct and in the process uh, what are very limited resources in terms of taxes uh, which should be used to 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 educate young people to make sure that they are healthy uh, are being deployed in just keeping some people comfortable in fact there is this view uh, and actually is an observation that uh, you know the biggest money lenders in rural maharashtra are retired school teachers right because their pension they're living in villages their pensions are so large now that they become money lenders so there is a distortion that this uh, this this entails which uh, because of the silent majority see the 98% who are not getting this they have no voice or rather they they don't even understand what this means whereas the 2% who stand to benefit from it are very vocal and are very even have the government's ear thankfully uh, given that in the recent elections in the states where this was promised by the opposition uh, they still lost the elections uh, based on some of the public utterances of some leadership from that party it does seem that this will now again go back to the back burner right and just to kind of put this into perspective how much of a burden uh is is this i mean burden is the wrong word but if you think of it is percentage of expenses etc how much is for us uh, pension expenses so versus? for uh, for the state governments as a whole uh, it has already become as large as 8 to 9% of total expenditure right for uh, governments in total it is about 40% of salary expenditure and for governments in up and bihar for example so it is very distorted for governments in up and bihar the salary expenditure is now less than the pension expenditure wow so so what happens with uh, with 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 the governments who have promised this and you know and 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 as the uh, as the life expectancy keeps rising uh, so even the assumptions made earlier on uh, if there were any assumptions made my my understanding is people just promised this without even doing a calculation on how much it costs uh in the future the problem is that now you are paying uh you are using precious taxpayer dollars to to take care of very handful of people who are also no longer working so this can actually become a very large burden and this keeps growing see i've been doing state budgets analysis for the last decade uh you know whether anything else grows or not uh, one aspect that keeps growing is the pension cost right because uh, all states uh, so the center shifted to the new pension scheme after 2004 people have joined after that are on defined contribution states took a while some states have still not transitioned and uh, so by 2007 8 i think most states had done it so for the next 20 25 years at least if not 30 years the pension bill will keep rising nearly in double digits right uh, because there is also an inflation adjustment that happens there right and while the npf the new pension scheme is in force but as you were discussing earlier the right now the the kind of everybody who's retiring right now is retiring as part of the old pension scheme correct and that will continue for another at least 20 30 years yes uh, and it's only after that that the benefits of the correct. Uh, npa so uh, we will see this pension cost rise yes. even further yes. uh, from the current levels so yeah so that was one uh, you know kind of topical topic i want to kind of cover the second one is this uh, the notion of the state finances versus central finances and the uh, first the difference between them what what is a state finance and what is a central finance and secondly what's happening here is there I mean, are both moving in the right direction is there something to do in one versus the other how are things uh, evolving here see this comes down to at a very basic level uh, 
to how to run a country which is 17% of global population, right? So you need to have a federal structure uh, because there's so much disparity within the states, right? So there are states where kindergartens are being shut, schools are being shut because there are not enough kids. There are schools where fertility rate is still about three. You have places with no water, there are places with abundant water, they have, uh, uh, you know, average life expect average uh, uh, age is much higher, average is much lower. Some are industrial, like, you know, Tamil Nadu, uh, industrial share of GDP is 45%, uh, whereas uh, agriculture share is in, in single digits, right? So, because of this diversity, I think states need to have a lot more of fiscal freedom. Uh, and and they need to be able to spend on what is important for them. So some states will want to spend and should be spending a lot more on irrigation, on drinking water. Some states which are much more urbanized need to spend on metro rail and all of that. So you need to have a lot of fiscal freedom that you need to give to the states. The second big difference between states is their level of per capita income. Right. And therefore their tax inputs. So for example, there are some states where uh, uh, three-fourths of, nearly three-fourths of receipts are transfers from the center. Uh, and there are some states where it's only one-fourth. Right. Three-fourths are their own taxes. So, for example, you know, where the real estate market is, is very important, like in Mumbai, Pune, Nagpur, etc. You know, property and stamp duty registration is a very big source of income. Uh, developed society, developed uh, uh, state governments or de developed states also have more SGST collection and so on and so forth. Uh, the, uh, so therefore, there is a lot of fiscal diversity. The, the way the, the Indian Union is structured, remember we are not a federation of states, we are a union of states, which means that the center is the primary, uh, has primacy and the center decides, uh, so the states cannot break away when they want to, it's a union of states. And uh, so, so to a large extent, the state's uh, ability to borrow uh, has also been controlled. So under Article 293 of the Constitution, the state governments cannot borrow uh, without the permission of the central government, so long as they owe money to the central government. So there was a time when only the center could borrow. The market for state governments to borrow didn't exist. Till right. the, the mid-90s, uh, almost all the borrowing was done by the center and then they would allocate the, the debt. Uh, so they would onward lend to state governments. Uh, so till 2026-27, almost every state government will have uh, some exposure to or would have borrowed something from the, from the center. Some of that will roll off, but this also includes, uh, you know, loan guarantees. So for example, if you have taken JICA, which is a Japanese, uh, uh, you know, lender, um, uh, and it has been guaranteed by the central government. Uh, even that will count for this. So, so the center can, uh, as per the constitution, control how much a state government can borrow. So, in, that is the mechanism through which it caps the fiscal deficit of the states. Right. So, the state governments cannot have a fiscal deficit above three percent of GDP. Right. Unless the center allows it. So, during COVID, for example. They said, okay, you can have a higher fiscal deficit if you want to, so long as if you have, you're doing it for CAPEX, you are trying to su support the economy or whatever. There is, uh, at the central level, no cap. As we discussed, the FRBM law is a self-disciplining, self-regulatory kind of law. So, uh, the, the center can uh, borrow as much as it wants uh, and have a high, uh, as high a fiscal deficit as it wants. The problem with having too high a fiscal deficit is because crowding out. And if your debt to GDP becomes too high, the only way to service it is by inflating it away. What that means is that suppose your, your, your debt to GDP is say 100%. In India's case, it is about 81, 82. But suppose it is 100%. It's a nice round number. And suppose your fiscal deficit in a year is say 6%. Right. Now, unless your denominator is also growing at 6%, this ratio will keep growing. Right. Now, the denominator growth has to be in, in uh, nominal terms. Now, if you are a country like the US and your real GDP growth is 2% and your fiscal deficit uh, is say 7.5% at the federal level, 
unless you have 4 to 5 percent inflation, this ratio will keep going up. And nothing can keep going up forever, right? So at some point it becomes unsustainable. And uh, so, so similar constraints apply to most governments. And the only solution to where the US is headed uh, is to have structurally higher inflation. Because then you will keep the, the denominator uh, elevated and what they, you will do what is what is called financial repression in the sense that the yield on government bonds will be kept artificially low and below inflation and which means that the savers who have given money to the government will actually not be able to make the returns which can beat inflation right? so it becomes a loss so that is how so it's like uh, you know uh, inflation is uh, a slow default mm. Right? So, you are you're refusing to pay because you can't. Yep. And uh, uh, so, that is why sovereigns generally don't default. I mean, they will… They will. They just print more money. They print more money and cause high inflation, cause financial repression and that's how they service it. So, in India's case, I think uh, the centre clearly for the next decade has to keep its fiscal uh, uh, focus uh, very strong. Uh, the quality of expenditure has to be maintained at a very high level. Remember that if your debt to GDP is very high, like it is in India, very aggressive fiscal consolidation can actually make it worse. Yeah. Make it worse because your denominator then starts to shrink or does not grow fast enough. And so, therefore, you have to bring it down slowly, right? So, it's like uh, a sportsman who has sort of sprained a muscle, you cannot let it stay, 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 stay uh, you know, untouched and you have to slowly bring it back to normal. Uh, at the state level, I think some of the states are in a decent position. So, their debt to GDP, uh, which as per the FRBM law, uh, for the FRBM review committee should have been at 20 percent on average. Some states are below, below that, 15, 16 percent. Some states are at 28, 30 percent as well. Right. And some of the states like say Kerala, West Bengal, Punjab, their interest cost, salary and pensions are 60 to 65 percent of their total expenditure. Wow. So, in a way, they have pretty much no capacity or very limited capacity to spend on, uh, you know, infrastructure or improved healthcare or improved education uh, for, for their people because they have been somewhat profligate with their spending in the past. Mostly because of a big conundrum or a, not a conundrum. Um, see, in India, despite very divergent debt to GDP ratios at the state level, debt to GSDP ratio at the state level, the cost of borrowing for various states is not very different. Right. And that is because of what is seen as an implicit government sovereign guarantee, guarantee, sovereign yeah. guarantee that the centre will not let them default. Now, that has also meant that some of the states have actually been very irresponsible with their spending. And uh, like, you know, this recent new government that came up in Telangana, because there is also a lot of political uh, you know, thinking behind such statements, but they are saying that the coffers are running dry. That uh, you know, there has been so much of distribution of uh, government revenues that uh, uh, there is nothing left to spend on productive things. So, there are some states where, which I think are in a much worse position, uh, but that will show up in the quality of expenditure rather than the quantity of expenditure. Understood. Great. Very helpful, uh, Nilkar. One final question on India before we move on to other countries. Uh, uh, India borrows both domestically as well as internationally. Uh, no? Uh, no, the sovereign uh, does not have any foreign bonds. Okay. And so, any reason for this? Oh, yeah. Uh, and the reason is that you do not want to see, um, it is I think the ignominy of what the, the state felt in 1991. Right. When you, you ran out of dollars and you had to pledge your gold and you had technocrats coming in and advising the government and controlling your policy. Uh, so, if you, if you talk to anyone who was in the saddle around that time, oh, their eyes will, uh, their ears will go red thinking right. about it, right. So, just the shame of having someone coming and advising you. So, uh, uh, so anyone of that era, and I think with, with the right uh, reasons, uh, has been very uncomfortable with uh, allowing the sovereign to borrow abroad. Right. 
but they have, uh, as india has become more comfortable and as you know as the economy grows you have to open up your capital account i think allowing foreign investors to buy rupee bonds in india is something which is now i think very free i don't mean it is possible now to right. do it uh, there is 300 trillion 300 billion dollars of such loans which uh, bonds which they can freely buy but indian sovereign because you know the moment you borrow in dollars uh, the indian sovereign can then be sued in a foreign court right and you know this was perhaps necessary at some point uh, it could have been necessary at some point when india was very short of dollars but now that the balance of payment situation is much healthier i think there is no need for india to also issue dollar bonds great that was an insightful conversation we had on debt starting with a very interesting perspective on the history of debt and with debt uh, as a tool for uh, distributing resources in a more productive manner in the economy and hence we spoke about how if the debt can be used in a productive manner uh, then you know it can be a very positive tool we also spoke about how the levels of debt and hence debt being sustainable is important because debt increases risk and so on the upside it can give us more benefits on the downside it can hurt us more and so we have to be covered for that risk we spoke a little bit about the uh, indian government's uh, uh, debt profile and how uh, we manage this this both at the central level and at the state level and there we discussed two topical subjects the first one was the old pension scheme versus the new pension scheme and the second one was the Uh, central finances versus the state government finances it's a very interesting topic uh, i hope you enjoyed it as much as we enjoyed bringing it to you thank you thank you for listening into this episode of open dialogue i hope you enjoyed this as much as we've enjoyed bringing it to you we are overwhelmed by the response that we've received and really look forward to your comments and feedback do like and subscribe to our channel to keep track of new episodes that are coming through thank you